So please join me in welcoming our next speaker, Timothy Ingold from the University of Aberdeen. And uh, he's going to be giving us a talk called uh, The Social Brain. Thanks very much. Uh, I was actually asked by the organizers to, or instructed by the organizers to give, my, give a talk on the social brain. Um, it's not a title that I chose myself and it's a challenge for me because whenever I hear the praise social brain, the first thing that comes to mind is what is widely known among evolutionary psychologists as the social brain hypothesis. And this is a hypothesis to which I am resolutely opposed. I think it's dreadful. On the one hand, it reduces the social to the operative, and on the other hand, it elevates the brain to the executive, making social life look like the aggregate effect of brains telling their owners what to do. The challenge for me, then, is to ascertain whether an alternative understanding might be possible, both of the social and of the brain, according to which the notion of the social brain could actually make some sense. So in this spirit, I'm not sure if it works, but I'll attempt to show that the brain is social because life is. Brain tissue grows in the matrix of the social, much, I think, as vegetation grows in the matrix of the earth. And in this sense, everything that lives is social. The brain, as envisaged by advocates of the social brain hypothesis, by contrast, is itself a purely hypothetical entity. It can neither live nor grow. So first of all, what is this hypothesis, this so-called social brain hypothesis? It all goes back to an influential paper published in 1976 by the psychologist and student of animal behavior, Nick Humphrey. In this paper, Humphrey argued that the principal selective pressures behind the evolution of the so-called higher intellectual faculties of humans and other primates lay not in the technical dealings of these animals with objects in their physical environments, but in their social dealings with one another in the context of life in close-knit communities of conspecifics. Dubbed at the time the Machiavellian intelligence hypothesis, Humphrey's idea inspired a good deal of work on the complex dynamics of relationships in social groups of monkeys and apes. Introducing a collection of papers on the subject published in 1988, Andy Whiten and Dick Byrne triumphantly declared that the idea of social intelligence is one whose time has come, although it's actually had many antecedents. And clearly this work was intended to convey a message about the evolution of those cognitive and intellectual faculties that are supposed to be unique to humans. Well, to a social anthropologist like myself, what was most striking about it, it seemed to me, was that the model of human sociality invoked to set the pattern of non-human primate life seemed to owe more to the researchers' own dealings with colleagues in academic conferences and senior common rooms than to the experience of everyday life in small and intimate groups. So a Cambridge common room is a somewhat Machiavellian environment, but whether you can extend the Cambridge common room to uh, hunter-gatherers or chimpanzees is another matter. Humphrey even described the society of primates as a collegiate community, and he was, of course, from Cambridge. <laughs> According to the traditional account of the evolution of human intelligence, which goes back to Darwin and Wallace, the pressures that favoured intellectual advance lay in man's, and it was specifically man's and not woman's, interactions with components of the physical environment, such as predators and prey. The use and manufacture of tools played a central role in this argument. Men who were more sagacious, as Darwin liked to say, with bigger and better brains, could design more ingenious tools, thereby securing a reproductive advantage. So intelligence-enhancing variations would tend to be preserved in future generations, leading to yet further advances in the technical sphere, and so on, through mutual enforce reinforcement. This view of the evolution of intelligence continued to enjoy considerable support. For example, uh, Sue Parker and Kathleen Gibson in a 1979 paper in Behaviour and Brain Sciences 
argued that feeding strategies and, above all, extractive foraging with tools were the primary determinants of the kind of intelligence possessed by the earliest hominids, and that its further development was an adaptive response to complex hunting involving things like aimed missile throwing, stone tool manufacture, animal butchery, food division, and the construction of shelters. Now, following Humphrey's lead, critics of this kind of traditional view argued that the intellectual capacities demonstrated by non-human primates in laboratory settings, where they were tested on various tasks involving the manipulation of gadgets of different kinds, are far in excess of anything they might need for dealing with their physical environments under natural conditions. Since natural selection does not generally perfect an attribute beyond the level <coughs> that's necessary to ensure that an animal gets by in its normal circumstances, some other factor must be adduced to account for the apparently excess capacity. And that factor, uh, was argued, is complex sociality. Given the relatively long period of dependency of the young, which is conducive to the transmission of behaviour by learning, and the consequent overlap of generations in the social group, the potential for intra-group conflict is as great as the need to maintain community solidarity. The management of relationships with other individuals in the group therefore calls for considerable skill because at every moment the animal has to anticipate not only the immediate effects of its own actions but also the ways that these actions might be perceived by others and how their outcomes then may be qualified by actions initiated by these others on the basis of their own perceptions. It's a very complicated chess game going on. If the intellectual capacities of non-human primates were enhanced through selection for social skills, then, so the argument goes, the same must have been true in the evolution of our own species. For the technical problems that confronted our ancestors in their procurement of subsistence were not particularly difficult. Most would already have been solved and had only to be learned by each generation from its predecessors. But it's precisely the importance of learning which takes the weight of technical problems of adaptation that sets such a heavy load on social ones. Now, in a 1998 paper entitled The Social Brain Hypothesis, psychologist Robin Dunbar returned to the issue of why it is that humans have such big brains. He explains that the traditional consensus was that brains evolved to process information of ecological relevance. But why should humans need brains of extraordinary size and complexity and which are hugely expensive in terms of the amount of energy needed to keep them going in order to achieve what other animals can manage perfectly well with much smaller ones? Dunbar's proposal is that large brains reflect the computational demands of complex social systems. In effect, what had been called the Machiavellian intelligence hypothesis was now renamed the social brain hypothesis. It's basically the same thing. What other, so what, what other possible explanations are there, Dunbar asks, to account for primate brain evolution? Well, one possibility is that it is epiphenomenal, simply a byproduct of increased uh, body size. So body size increases, brain size increases too in proportion. Another possibility is that it's developmental, that it has to do, for example, with the maternal metabolic input in early brain development. It's an idea that goes back to Engels, who thought we had big brains because we ate lots of meat. But given the energy costs of large brains, Dunbar argues, you'd think that natural selection would favour curbs on excessive brain growth unless it conferred an actual positive advantage. And yet the very opposite seems to have happened. And this leads Dunbar to the final pair of possible explanations, namely the ecological and the social. An example of an ecological explanation might be that if you live by foraging, you need a large brain to help you remember where the food is, or again, if you forage over a large range, you need a, la 